lovely. And uh, with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six of us in the room, so it's another hybrid meeting. So uh, we'll get underway. Tēnā tātou katoa. We seek wisdom, understanding, insights into the views and circumstances of others, strength to seek what we believe in, humility to accept the combined decisions of others, patience, good humour at all times, tolerance and courtesy while working in the best interests of our community. Uh, so welcome everyone to the penultimate, the, I think that was a pipakoom term, penultimate, uh, meeting of uh, the, the governing body. Um, uh, I'll ask Sandra first of all to do a roll call to determine uh, who is present. Marina Koto, members. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Aye. Councillor Bartley. Morena. Morena. Councillor Collins. Kia ora, Sandra. Kia ora, folks. Councillor Coombe. Kia ora, kei kōneo. Councillor Cooper. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Dalton. He's not arrived yet. Councillor Darby. Morning, Sandra and members. Councillor Filipina. <coughs> Councillor Fletcher. Present. Councillor Henderson. Kia ora. Councillor Hills. Kia ora koutou katoa. Morena, Sandra. Morena. Councillor Mulholland. Sorry to interrupt, Sandra. Yes. Councillor Philip Present. Reina. Thank you. Councillor Mulholland. Councillor Newman. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Councillor Sayers. Councillor Simpson. Morning, everyone. Councillor Stewart. Good morning. Councillor Walker. Good morning. Councillor Watson. Present. Councillor Young. Kia ora. Da jia zao sang hao. Kia ora. Can we just check, um, Councillor Sayers, are you with us at this time? No. Okay, back to you, Mayor Phil. Um, Good morning. Sorry, there was a... I think that's uh, Councillor Tracy Mulholland. Um, there are one or two that uh, will be joining us. I think Councillor Dalton is coming in person, so she may be caught in the traffic. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Cathy Casey. Uh, Cathy's unfortunately having a bit of a relapse uh, from her uh, COVID, and when I talked to her earlier in the week was um, yeah, not sounding too too great at all. So our, our thoughts are uh, with Cathy. Um, I have um, apologies for early departure from councillors Walker and Watson, who are attending an Auckland Transport Board meeting, who will be absent um, probably between 10.45 and noon. And an apology from councillor Collins, who's got a a funeral and will be absent for about the same time. So if I could ask maybe Councillor Coombe and Councillor Cooper to move and second the uh, acceptance of apologies uh, and noting that Councillor Dalton has, has got here um, and Councillor Bartley is also with us, I can see on screen. Um, oh, sorry, I, sorry, sorry, Your Worship. I wanted to add my apologies for early departure as well. I'm going to the AT board meeting. Okay. So, uh, yep, uh, we'll add that to the list of apologies. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. So, all those in favour, I've, I've please... I've joined you as well. Sorry, sorry um, Phil, I've joined you as well. Sorry, I'm that's sorry. Councillor Sayers. Yeah, uh, Councillor Sayers. Yeah, yep, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, all those in favour of uh, those apologies being accepted, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. Are there any, is there any councillor that needs to declare a, a, a conflict of interest in any of the business before us today? 
If not, we move on to the um, confirmation of minutes, and these are the minutes of uh, Thursday the 28th of July, uh, 2022. Um, so uh, if I can ask maybe Councillor Dalton to move that and Councillor Young uh, to, uh, to second that. Um, I'll put the motion that we confirm the ordinary minutes of that meeting. All those in favour, please aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. Uh, item number five is petitions. There are none. And item number six is public input. And we have um, one request for input today uh, from Naomi McCleary from the Going West Trust. So if Naomi's here and anyone who may be wishing to join her at the table, please, please come forward to the table. Um, this is in relation to uh, the first substantive item on the agenda, which is the transfer of Morris Shadbolt House and the Writer's Studio uh, in, in Titarangi to the Going West Trust. So, Naomi, thank you very much for, for being here in person today. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you may wish to introduce your colleague, and uh, uh, we've got uh, five minutes and then any uh, for, for the presentation, and then, then usually there may be one or two questions. Thank so, um, welcome here today, and uh, the floor is yours. Maureen and Councillors, and this is uh, our, our archivist, our heritage archivist, uh, Graham Burgesson. I think some of you will know him very well. Um, behind I have the director of the Going West Festival, James Littlewood, and the, uh, um, our oral history archivist, Anna Fomerson, who are also here to support us today. Um, thank you for the, for the privilege of speaking to you all this morning. I have an image that was going to come up, which is really just a scene setter for you. So my history with the Shadbolt House story goes back to the initial purchase of the property by Waitakere Council in 2006. Since then, with the support of the Going West Trust and the Waitakere Rangers Local Board, there's been a steady body of work undertaken to see this legacy project in Morris Shadbolt's name come to fruition. The report before you today chronicles much of that very well. There are a couple of points that I would like to make that a formal report can't cover. Peter Biggs, CEO of New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, in an opinion piece re recently in the Sunday Star Times, had this to say. There are aspects of human experience that cannot be reduced to numbers on a spreadsheet. You cannot quantify the joy that comes in the recognition in the first few pages of a newly opened book that you've come across a masterpiece. Likewise, you cannot quantify the magic of the cultural value that comes from being in a house whose walls have seen the creation of a major writer's entire 40-year canon of work. This is Shadbolt House. My long experience with the McCann House residency, artist residency, which is but a stone's throw from Arapito Road, affirms that the power of cultural association with one of Aotea's great artists is immeasurably powerful. The report does reference the fact that, the, that a residency benefits a small number of individual writers, but this is simply a starting point. That benefit ripples out to include readers, publishers, and the strength of the literary sector in general. A good res residency program also interacts with public education and with schools and with tertiary institutions. This, along with a close interaction with the Going West Writers' Festival, is what the Shadbolt Residency project can be. COVID has changed our world. It has changed our conversation about what genres of writing might be supported through this residency program. We expect to respond to the renaissance in Māori and Pacifica writing. We intend to support Asian writers and those from other cultures. We also acknowledge that Maurice Shadbolt um, you know, paid the bills with long-form journalism writing for the Reader's Digest and National Geographic. We wish to bring some focus to long-form journalism at this time as an antidote to the global tide of misinformation and disinformation. Conversations to date with leaders in this field indicate that this would bring immense value to the public discourse. Our hard achievements to date towards this project are as follows. A full conservation plan completed in 2013 by Graham Burgess and Lucy Tree, his partner. Operational plans, four to date as the years have rolled by, um, and one completed recently, which does take into account the, the COVID situation. 
building assessments and reports, a couple by council and another by the trust. Geotech and engineering reports, these have been fed into the resource and building consents for the stage one foundation repair, which is recent, and they have been recently approved. An oral history program underway to collect first-hand accounts of Maurice Shadbolt, his life and his work. This is in the hands of our oral historian, Anna Fomerson. And early discussions with potential funders and partners, the Michael King Writers Centre, CNZ, tertiary providers, and leading writers. The Going West Trust is very mindful of the task ahead. Quotes for the initial foundation work sit at around $330,000. I think 10 years ago they sat at about 65,000 or something like that. Um, while we work towards achieving that goal, we will also be designing and refining the residency program, building partnerships and structuring a management plan. But I'm gonna finish with Morris, Morris's own words about this place. And it's from his memoir, the Edge of the Sky, From the Edge of the Sky. Much of my life, possibly too much, has been lived in a studio set above a serene New Zealand estuary. This hermit high art, where I write now, is fringed with spindly mangroves, wreathed with rainforest, and always under seeds from loudmouth birds. A little later, he says, most of my dozen novels, and more than a score of stories beside, have taken form under this roof. My studio, call it a cabin or office if you wish, something less fancy, sits among the sea-filled foothills of the Waitakere Ranges, overlooking the vast Manukau Harbour, one of the world's largest. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that, Naomi, and it was a wonderful uh, quote uh, to, to end on. I think it, uh, it sums it up quite well, and the skill of the writer, loud-mouthed birds, I like that. Um, uh, Graham, is there anything that you want to briefly add to that? Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think one of the things that Naomi hasn't sort of um, has described and hinted at is actually to do with the McCann House and how the McCann House Trust also is supported by council. What a wonderful um, thing that has been in terms of the kaupapa that it brings to not only the west but to the whole of Auckland and that you do have this rolling residency program. I became involved in that first through Naomi and was lucky enough to be part of the restoration of the house. And then I watched as it actually turned into this thing that actually keeps on generating sort of not only activity, but it actually sort of brings the community into the place. And I believe that, um, that the model that the Going West Trust have running for this, it's not just for writers, it's actually going to generate amazing community value and actually community pride which I think is a very important thing for council to be supporting. Yeah thank you Graham and I think uh, the West has a lot to be proud of actually um, with the uh, McCann and with Morris Shadbolt and I had the privilege of meeting with the people um, from the Colin McCann Trust uh, relatively recently but keeping that heritage uh, alive from people that really have made their mark internationally as, as well as nationally is important. So I'll just open it up for, for questions. Uh, are there any questions? I think you'll find a fairly sympathetic uh, audience here today. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. Thank you, um, Naomi and Graeme. I, just, I guess I just want to um, ask you to kind of, because you were previously public arts manager for Waitakere City, so you've got great credentials, right? And, and you started up going West Festival. There's a whole lot of accolades I could give you and, and I'm very thankful um, for the work you've done for West Auckland and Auckland in terms of literature and uh, literature. Um, you able to just kind of get a sense of, I mean, I was there at the time um, in Waitakere when we purchased the house, but are you able to kind of give a vision of what, you know, the, the time that's, times that we were in, what we were looking to do, um, and also um, the ability of the trust to be able to raise those funds um, once the house goes into your own or lease goes, you know, get the lease so that you have got that ability to raise funds. Sorry, it's pretty bad. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Um, I, I, the vision always was one that was, was a sort of collaborative vision between the family, the Shadbolt family, and Waitakere Council at that time. Um, we already had the model of the McCann House, as Graham has referred to, and so we had a model of best practice. Um, 
And really the only thing that has changed in that vision is that the world has changed and COVID has changed the world a little bit, which is why I made that reference to long form journalism, because I think that that's something we probably wouldn't have even thought of back in, in those early days. Oh. Um, so the vision remains consistent, it's just been contemporized, I suppose. In terms of the ability to raise that money, of course it will be a struggle, but we have access to the major funding bodies. I have already had a conversation with Lotteries Heritage and indeed we are eligible to go to them and we can continue to go back to them as the various stages of upgrading the house happen. Because as you will understand from the report, we've got to get the foundation sorted basically before we can get a full lease. And that's, that's the proposal that is before you today. Um, and yeah, that, I, in a way that's the biggest hurdle. I think once we've got that hurdle, we'll be able to go back to um, the same funders for the other stages. Because I mean, the house is, um, it can be made very comfortable. It's not mm. flash, it's a family home. Mm. And I think that's one of its charms, really. Mm. Um, the thing that, uh, that image on the screen is, is from the seaward side. But when you're up in that house, the view down into Little Muddy Creek is just one of the most pristine mm. views that you could possibly imagine. And of course, a little no exit street, it's the quietest, quietest place. The studio down the hill, which we hope to restore at some stage, is where he did a lot of his writing. But Morris also wrote in the house. So it's the perfect environment, and it can be made just warm and comfortable and a, a, a retreat for a writer to do a body of work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Naomi. I don't have any other questions, uh, so basically just a brief comment uh, of, of really thanks to the Trust for the hours of voluntary work that you've put in, and I, I think this is a potential to be a win-win situation for council, local board, uh, and for the Going West Trust. And what an absolute inspiration for a young writer to be in that place where Morris Shadbolt did so much of his writing mm. and be surrounded by that aura. Um, it, it, I think it's a great thing to do. So really appreciate the hard work that you've put in, and uh, I'm sure we'll have support for uh, the resolution before us today. So I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Cooper to move and Councillor Henderson to second um, a motion uh, of thanks uh, for your presentation. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I declare that carried and you're most welcome to wait for the presentation of the local board and then it'll be the first item on the agenda today. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you all of you, thank you. Right, uh, next item on the agenda is on exactly the same topic, um, the local uh, local board input, and we have the Waitakere Rangers local board here, represented by Saffron Toms and Sandra uh, Coney. So I'll invite you both to the table, and uh, thank you for, for being here. Um, so Saffron, are you you're leading off as chair? So you know the routine, I don't need to go through that with you. Um, so welcome to hear your comments and Sandra's comments, thank you. Kia ora tato katoa, thank you, Your Worship, and councillors for hearing us today. Um, we are very excited that we've come to this, um, to this point in this long pro project. As you will hear, the um, house was purchased by Waitakere City Council in 2006. I began working on it in my first term in 2013 when Sandra Coney was the chair. And so in 2022, nine years later, it will be very wonderful to be able to get this signed off and over to the community, uh, to the um, Going West Trust. Um, in a moment, I'll pass over to Sandra Coney, who was chair of the board in 2013 and has held the mantle for this on, on behalf of the board consistently, working with the high caliber people from the Going West Trust um, and um, there's been a lot of perseverance and it's been a long road, so we're very excited that, about that today. We were just talking recent, uh, recently about the, um, about the value of the trust, and, and one of the things that I see is really valuable about this particular house and this particular writer's residence is its potentiality to actually offer a residence for, um, for writers with families, with children, because it is a family home. So a lot of our, writer, our artist retreats don't really have that capacity to cater for, for um, artists and writers with children. We're obviously very, very proud of our history um, and our, our heritage in the Waitakere Rangers area. Um, even when I was a child, 
we had dirt roads and it was a toll call to the city and it was where a lot of us, a lot of the creatives, the bohemians lived with not much money and yes, the loudest thing were the raucous birds. So we're very excited we finally got here and feel, are feeling more and more optimistic that our, um, that our optimism is warranted. Um, over to Sandra. Kia ora, Mr Mayor and councillors present here and, and online. We're really delighted as a board to be at this point in the story of the Morris Chadbolt writers and residents. As you, as you can see from your report, the property was purchased in 2006 by Waitakere City Council with a view to establishing a writers and residence, and we've been pursuing that goal since that time. We've unanimously, consistently supported this project, most recently at the request of management in the last few weeks. Maurice Shadbold, of course, is one of New Zealand's most loved authors, with 11 novels to his credit, the, white, the World War I history shown here, short stories, journalism, plays and film. He was very popular as a writer, and his works are still studied in New Zealand schools. He lived for 40 years in the house in Arapito Road and wrote in the studio and in the house. The residency provides an opportunity for writers to experience the cultural cachet of being in the very place this esteemed writer lived and worked, to enjoy the quiet of this bush-clad Titterangi site and be inspired by Morris's legacy. When I became the chair of the local board in 2013, I met with the Michael King Trust to get their views on a writer's residency on the other side of the harbour. And they were enthusiastic and talked about how the two trusts could work together for mutual benefit. And as you've heard from Naomi, the Going West Trust has exciting plans for how the residency could operate. They're not looking at the residency in a traditional way, but have more imaginative plans that would provide wider benefits than to a single writer. Although car access is limited, as it's mentioned in the report, this is a family house in a residential area and it would be quite possible to bring people into the house for workshops via shuttle bus. The writer's residency in, his, in Morris's house has the potential to be an asset to Auckland and to com complement the goal of the local board that Titterangi is an arts hub for the West, with the Going West Literary Fe Festival seen in this photo, to Uru Gallery, McCann House, a theatre and music events. The board is very confident in the ability of the Going West Trust to implement this project. They have a track record of achievement, having held the Writers' Festival since 1996, and some trust members, as you heard, are involved in the McCann House. When we come to the house, it's basic and needs a great deal of work doing to it. The board allocated 100,000 for work a few years ago, but we're told that something around 800,000 still needs to be spent on it. Over the years this proposal has taken to be processed within council, we've seen costs increase, so the board wants to see this transfer happen now. This responsibility is beyond the local board, so an advantage of the transfer of the house is that the Going West Trust will raise the funds to carry out this work. If the trust does not achieve this in the time set, the house reverts to the council and the ownership of the land stays with the council throughout. Another advantage of the agreement with the Going West Trust is that they understand the importance of the house as a scheduled heritage house. In fact, the trust commissioned the conservation report seen here. So we can be confident that any work carried out in the house will be consistent with its heritage values. And the house will also be publicly accessible within the programme the Going West Trust develops. As well as work on the house, the grounds need clearing. And if you're wondering what that is, that's the studio. And most of the greenery you can see there is wheat, pest plants. These are very kind of very strong growth of pest plants on the property. Not so bad now as it was. And next door, that's the McCann house on the right, that is a reserve called the Arapito Reserve there on the left. And you can see it's similarly infested with weeds. However, the local Titarangi community has already shown a great deal of interest in the project and the South Titarangi Neighbourhood Network has partnered in tackling the pest plants both on the, on the um, Morris Abbott property but also on the Arapito Reserve. We've already held one working bee to tackle these problems and another is scheduled for this Sunday. 
So that's the, um, the Sunday coming event. You can be assured that there is huge support for this project in the West and the benefits will be held much more widely. So we commend to you the resolutions before you today and ask for your support to bring this, to this, bring this long-standing project to fruition and really welcome the words from you, Mr Mayor, in support of the project. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sandra and uh, Saffron, and thank you both for the work that you've done to and the board and acknowledging uh, Councillor Cooper, who was on the Waitakere City Council, and uh, Sir Bob Harvey, of course. I, um, I have no doubt that there's really strong support in the local community uh, for this project. And uh, looking at the photos, I don't envy you the amount of work that needs to be done, but that will be done with, uh, with enthusiasm for uh, what is a fantastic cause. And just, just being in that house and thinking back to what Morris contributed and looking back at those photos, um, uh, I do so with an element of nostalgia and the thought of a toll call to town, uh, Saffron, when we won't have landlines for very much longer, uh, that certainly creates the historical complex. I'm sure you're far too young to remember that. Um, just to see if there are any questions, I think it's pretty self-evident actually, and uh, uh, I am expecting strong support for the, the recommendation. So there are no questions, so um, this time I'll ask actually Councillor Shane Henderson to move and Councillor Cooper to second uh, motion of thanks for your presentation and for your work. Uh, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. Thank you very much. And again, you're welcome to, um, to remain for the, uh, for the next item. Uh, the next item is actually extraordinary items and I've been uh, advised of uh, no uh, no business in that respect and we therefore come to item number nine the transfer of Auckland council owned Morris Shadbolt's house and writer's studio uh, at Arapito Road to Tarangi to the Going West uh, Trust and I'm not sure whether we have uh, officers uh, I think they're online so acknowledge Philippa Carroll our community lease advisor uh, Taryn Crew, our General Manager Community Facilities, and we've also got uh, Claudia Weiss and Yusuf Khan uh, with us. So um, if I can get, so we've got the motion on the table, which is to seek uh, approval from the governing body to transfer ownership of the, uh, of the assets, uh, that's the house and the studio, and a lease on the land uh, to the Going West Trust. Um, Councillor Linda Cooper, has asked to move and Councillor Shane Henderson asked to, to second this. And uh, I think, um, Philippa, you may be leading off uh, with a report from officials. Uh, Kira, yes, I've... Sorry, lost the connection. Yeah, my report just echoes um, what the uh, Going West Trust and the Waitakere Local Board have said. Uh, this just allows the trust to carry out all the amazing work they're going to do at you know no cost to council and like you said if it's a win-win situation for everybody thanks philippa that's uh, short and sweet and do we have anything um uh, from taryn or anybody else uh, from our offices i think um we've had a good introduction uh from going west trust and and from waitakere local board um so i'll open it up for i think i'll do questions and comments together um, so, Councillor Linda Cooper, to begin. Just the question is around, um, do we think this, when there will be building consent work required, I imagine, um, are we able to ensure support through that system? I'm not saying we shouldn't go through that system, absolutely, because it's, um, you know, the, the risk of instability on that slope, we've got to make sure it's done right, but um, will there be um, good support to get through that process? Um, because we know that can be tricky sometimes for the trust, or is that not your department? Um, no, regulatory is separate from CF, yes, but if they need anything like landowner approval, we will definitely support them with um, those types of letters. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Did you want me to speak? Yeah, if you'd like I'll to I'll get that done time. then. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, I mean, I, I'm very pleased to see this happening because the Going West Trust has always had bold aspirations and acted courageously in the things that they've wanted to do. Um, and it's amazing to see, without kind of a full council backing as they had before to be able to keep, but, but now the local board, to keep going with that. And it is often the same people that keep doing these in our communities. They're people that with vision 
Um, and also just the fact that it will address, you know, help to address the quality of writing. You know, we've had some amazing New Zealand writers, people like C.K. Stead, artists Colin McCann, Don Binney out west, and to be able to keep that legacy going and provide somewhere. I mean, our own, it's almost our own little Catherine Mansfield type um, retreat, but in Tatarangi. Um, but those opportunities for writers of all forms are critical to their development. But also, you know, often people just need that time because people are time poor and they've often got to, you know, do other jobs, all sorts of other things to actually um, ply their art and contribute really fully and richly to um, society and to the canon of work coming out of New Zealand. So I'm really pleased, you know, that you've been willing to take it on. It is really courageous because, as we know, voluntary organisations have to do the tough stuff, they have to raise the funds, they have to write the applications, they have to do all of that stuff and it's all unpaid, but it comes out of passion and love for what they do and actually um, investing in our future. You know, they're not doing it for themselves, they're doing it for our future and the future of writing. So I'm really pleased to support this and I hope everyone else does and I also um, know that there will still be a lot of support required in particular moral support from our local elected members out west, but I think this is bigger than the west. This is actually um, for Auckland and New Zealand. It's really critical that we've got um, supporting the art of writing. It's, it's getting lost, and as you said, it's all about the clickbait, which is a real detriment to, to real deep thinking and, and ideas and things like that. It, it's, it's like sheep following you know, a quick thrill, and, and we need less of that and more um, literature and, and things that provoke um, intelligent thought. So I think this is a really great opportunity. I remember actually visiting the site, gosh, it would have been about 2005, and even then it was like, oh, this needs a bit of work. But we know in the intervening 16 years, when nothing is lived in, there will be other issues, but... Um, this is a start to get this going, and we can be proud of another residence um, in, in the West um, for our artists. So thank you so much to the Trust, really appreciate it, and I look forward to support around the table, and thank you, Mr Mayor, for your kind words. Thank you very much, Councillor, and I think you've probably summed it up uh, beautifully. <laughs> there may not be a requirement for anybody else to, uh, to speak after that, but I'll just check if there's any questions or comments uh, that anybody else would like to make. No? Well, look, uh, just really repeating what I said before, I, I, I think it's fantastic uh, that the Going West Trust has picked up the, this challenge and uh, has the vision of what this, what this home can be in terms of a, a, future, a future writers in residence uh, location and preserving a, a piece of history that's important to the West but actually important to all of Auckland. Um, I think Linda's made a, a good case for the West being the cultural centre of the, the city in her comments, and the West has certainly produced people that um, you, you all can be rightly proud of. Uh, part of our history, part of my history, uh, the era in which uh, Morris was writing and writing about uh, very much coincides with uh, uh, a few other baby boomers, including myself, that are sitting uh, uh, in the room. I won't say around the table because... Um, well, maybe one or two around the table, uh, Deputy Mayor. So, look, uh, we, 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 yeah, few, few honest people owning up to this. Um, look, we, we wish the, the trust well in the task that you've got ahead of you, and I know you'll be supported by the local board, and you'll have our sympathy and support uh, in, in the ways that we can help to from, from Council for the future. So, um, really looking forward to seeing the outcome of what, what will happen on this site and, uh, and congratulate you all. Uh, it's been a long time coming, <laughs> you know, right back to the days of the Legacy Council uh, and it's time now to get on and, and realise that vision and get it done. So uh, with that, I'm going to put the motion. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Just waiting for any delay on for online uh, votes. Um, and those opposed, uh, no, I declare 
the motion carried, and I think carried unanimously. So thank you very much for everybody, and thank you for the work officials have done. What a great way to, to start the meeting today. Right, thank you very much. Now we get on to one or two slightly more mundane matters. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item number 10, has been referred to us by the Audit and Risk Committee, uh, and it's the Health, Safety and Wellbeing Report. And the motion uh, in front of us is to uh, receive the report. And uh, I think we do refer this one to local boards as well. So um, I'm going to ask Daniel Newman uh, as um, the leading member on the Audit and Risk Committee to move this, and maybe Deputy Mayor Cashmore to second it, and um, welcome Councillor Newman to introduce it, um, supported by Paul Robertson, the General Manager of Health, Safety and Wellbeing. Uh, Councillor Newman. Oh, look, thank you, Your Worship, uh, for the opportunity. Um, I'm happy to move this. Um, the report has been referred uh, from the Audit and Risk Committee, um, the committee uh, met the other day. Um, I commend the report and I appreciate the work that the officers have put into its preparation and the stewardship from Auckland Council in relation to the matters to be covered uh, therein. And I understand the officers are present in the town hall to answer any questions. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Paul, would you like to add to that? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so I will take the paper as read. Uh, there are a couple of points I might um, make for. Uh, for added context. Uh, so with the Omicron COVID-19 outbreak um, receding nationally, we are seeing a corresponding reduction in case numbers within uh, our staff. Uh, it is still, ex we are still experiencing a number of uh, service interruptions. However, we're seeing this as much from influenza and the common cold as from COVID-19. And our COVID-19 resilience plans are holding up well. On, uh, other matters, uh, we have two items from the Hawata Review recommendations that were made. Uh, the first is in relation to no excuse for abuse, uh, and this is a second phase of that campaign, uh, focusing on how we reduce the impact uh, of violence and aggression experienced by our staff by looking at how we redesign um, some of the work tasks which are um, uh, experiencing those uh, behaviours and providing further guidance material and training support to those staff. We've also uh, uh, made an external channel for Speak Up available, which closes out the Hawata Review recommendation in relation to that. That's now operating and is being used by uh, Kaimai. Uh, we've also commenced two projects to improve the, uh, the management of health, safety and wellbeing across Auckland Council. The first of which is a project to make improvements to the way we engage on uh, health, safety and wellbeing with our contractors. Uh, and the second is to ensure that where we have staff who are exposed to critical risks across the workplace, that we understand what those controls are and we have verification and assurance activities in place to ensure that our controls are effective. So those two programs have commenced um, since the last report to Council. Uh, apart from that, I will um, take the rest of the report as read and welcome any questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And uh, it's good to see that uh, the impact of COVID is, uh, is starting to recede. We are always reluctant to talk too soon on that, but uh, and also to see that the uh, the uh, incident rate is declining um, for a, for a, for a couple of reasons that you've spelt out in the report. So we'll move first of all to questions, and I have a, a question in the name of Councillor Richard Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, to the staff. Um, I guess just one question. To, or two questions. The first is the, the drop-off, which is great to see, of the um, incidents, especially of violence and aggression. I just, uh, my only concern is is that I, I see there is some mention to the drop-off in use of vaccine passes, so that has helped. But it does seem a drop-off from even pre-COVID time. So are we sure we're getting the reporting numbers through? Like it's not some sort of, you know, uh, desensitisation that people have just stopped reporting some of the things they may be used to report because there had been a spike, or are we confident of those numbers? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I guess we can never be fully confident of the numbers. Um, we don't know what we don't know. Um, if it's not reported, we won't know about many of the incidents. But the more serious incidents we capture through other means, so we have other mechanisms for identifying incidents, such as our ACC accreditation scheme. So those incidents that 
uh, reach a certain level of severity, we're confident that we have those reported. The minor uh, level uh, reporting, uh, we do know that there's always work to do to, uh, to improve reporting. I don't believe there's been a drop off uh, that we can identify, okay. but um, we continue to monitor that. So, and my second question is just around staff wellbeing and maybe, you know, if it crosses into HR or more management, um, then just let it go. But I guess is there, I'm seeing a lot more, and I have discussed this um, with the CEOs, um, uh, the requirements that we put on Jim, the CEO, um, but the um, concerns I have around people working over hours, nights, weekends, um, you know, we do get emails from staff very late at night. We know that they're overworked. No one complains about it, but we know it's happening. Is your team thinking of doing any work around that kind of staff exhaustion or the potential because of working at home, people just continue to work until they're finished tasks until sort of very late at night and what that could be doing to um, employee wellbeing? Thank you, Councillor. That's a great question. It is something that we're, uh, we're seeing more and more often now that we're moving into a more hybrid way of working, where people uh, are taking advantage of the flexibility that we offer and working different hours. So they may work uh, later in the day rather than earlier in the morning. So that, that does contribute a little to it. Uh, we are looking uh, with my colleagues in the People and Culture team at whether or not there's some ongoing work design, work issues, workload management, uh, issues that we can identify and, and manage out. Uh, we're currently reviewing the results of the late, latest staff engagement survey, which um, are providing some insights into this, and we'll continue to uh, report on that as we would normally. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, we'll see in a later item that there's been an improvement in staff engagement, which is uh, really welcome given the, the circumstances and the difficulties we've been through. I have no other questions, um, so I'll just see if there are any comments on the paper. Uh, some interesting information in it, um, generally positive, and, uh, but, but fairly, um, fairly routine as well. So, um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore, comment. Just a, a uh, comment concerning the Audit and Risk Committee's recommendations that there is ongoing training and education around elected members' responsibilities towards uh, safety and risk um, in our workplaces and in our environments. And I presume through the, you, Mr. Mayor, and to the Chief Executive, that this will be part of the induction program for the newly elected members in the new term that is given the suitable weight and um, push that it is to increase people's visibility and understanding of their actual elected responsibilities as an elected member. Thank you. Yep, I think, I think that's very important. Um, we have no other comments, um, so I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Uh, I declare that carried. Um, item number 11 is also referred from the Audit and Risk Committee in regard to uh, enterprise risk management activity. And uh, once again, I'm going to ask Councillor Daniel Newman to introduce it. Um, but welcome, uh, I think... Oh, and present, uh, Emma uh, Burke, General Manager of Risk and Assurance, and I think we have Andre, uh, yes, with us as well as the Senior Risk Advisor. Uh, so, Councillor Newman, if you'd like to introduce the item, please. Well, actually, can I get you to move that and Deputy Mayor Cashmore to second again, please? Well, thank you, Your Worship, once again. Yes, I'm happy to, happy to move this um, and uh, commending this report, which has been referred from the Audit and Risk Committee. We had a detailed discussion regarding the uh, the uh, activity update, uh, the, sorry, the enterprise risk management activity update um, at, the, uh, at, at the at the meeting the other day. Um, a number of matters were discussed, and I understand Andre and Emma are present in the town hall to address any questions that members have um, in response to uh, any matters that they may wish to raise. I certainly support them. I certainly support the item, Your Worship. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. And yeah, again, uh, I think um, it's a, a pretty straightforward report and good to see that the top risk financial is no longer trending upwards um, in line maybe with the BNZ report that we might have our inflation in the next uh, 12 months, which would be really welcome because I just had a report from, um, from the UK last night to suggest that theirs is probably going to 
hit uh, in the high teens. So we're, we're lucky our environment's a little bit better here. Um, Emma, would you like to introduce, or Andre? Thank you. I'll um, introduce the paper. Um, as mentioned, it is just an update, um, standard update that was presented to the Audit and Risk Committee on Tuesday. Um, the paper highlights changes in the risk drivers. Um, it's just reflecting the current um, environment that we're operating in. Um, these haven't um, then changed any of the overall risk ratings. Um, so I'll pass you over to Andre, who will take you through the paper in a little bit more detail. Thank you, yeah. Emma. Andre. Thank you, Your Worship, and other members of the body. Uh, I would just like to highlight in this report specifically the, uh, the risk appetite statement. We engaged with ELT to get their feedback, and some su changes were suggested, which we discussed at the ARC on Tuesday. I'm happy to report that we have two new risk appetite statements relating to Maori outcomes and the treaty relationships. I believe those will definitely support the achievement of Māori outcomes by the Auckland Council. The Auckland, uh, the, the ARC on Tuesday also indicated that it, it would be good if the risk team can engage with the governing body a, l a little bit more on risk specifically. So in the light of that, uh, we uh, certainly intend to have a risk workshop with governing body at an appropriate time in, in the near future. Other than that, I take the report as read, and, uh, and if there are any questions, Emma and I could take it, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I think the report's quite straightforward, but I'll just wait to see if there are any questions. I haven't had any registered with me. Um, are there any comments? No, so um, that's usually a good sign. Uh, lack of controversy is always good. Um, so I'm going to put this motion. Uh, it's to note the uh, the report. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Uh, I, I declare that carried. Um, now, thank you very much to officers. Um, item number 12 is the Local Government Electoral Legislation Bill. Uh, and I have Warwick McNaughton, who's going to lead that as our principal advisor. Uh, Rose Leonard, I think, is online as our manager of um, governance services. Um, uh, I'm just going to, if I can arbitrarily ask a couple of people to move and second that. Maybe, Angela, you'd like to move and Pippa, you'd like to second. Um, and uh, pretty much it's to approve the submission to Parliament. And I'm predicting that we'll approve it because what we've asked for is largely what we've got. Yeah. Um, but there's also uh, receiving the feedback from local boards and probably the most prominent piece of feedback is uh, the, an interest among a number of local boards that whether uh, provision could be made for representation uh, from Maori members at the local board level. But I think those submissions in, uh, will be attached to our governing body s submission and will speak for themselves. Uh, but Warwick, if you'd like to introduce, oh, uh, if you'd like to introduce the item at this point, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, Tenakoto members. I came across an article in the local government magazine on Tuesday, written by uh, Linda O'Reilly, who's a lawyer and writes regularly for the magazine. And the article was about this particular bill. <clears throat> and she ends up saying, the bill's a sensible amalgam of the aspirational and pragmatic. It forces councils to address the area of Māori representation without compelling them to adopt Māori wards or constituencies, and it plugs a few holes in the Act. Uh, this is what sensible legislation looks like. And so, as uh, His Worship has mentioned, the thrust of the submission um, is to recommend support for the bill. In the section in the report, which is headed Analysis and Advice, uh, we stepped through the amendments to the various acts, and I thought I'd just um, traverse those very briefly. Firstly, the amendments to the Local Government Auckland Council Act, uh, that removes the restriction on 20 councillors, which is something that we have been asking for for some time. The amendments to the Local Electoral Act, firstly, Māori wards, are the provisions, the suggested provisions in the, um, in the bill, I require a council, if it doesn't have Māori representation, to consider having it, but doesn't compel a council to, to have it. And uh, prior to making that sort of consideration, must engage with Māori and other communities of interest 
in the district or region in accordance with part six of the local government act and part six sets out the requirements in terms of making decisions and consulting people and so on. For a council who has had uh, Maori representation, they, there is no requirement to reconsider it, but a council may do if they wish. We've made a couple of uh, what I call observations, if you like, uh, in the submission. Uh, one observation is that the requirement to engage with Māori and uh, other communities of interest, uh, we're suggesting that the committee have a look at that wording. Uh, communities of interest, that phrase is a phrase that is used elsewhere in the Act, um, the Local Electoral Act, for example. And the one of the requirements when looking at representation reviews is to provide for effective representation of communities of interest. And uh, the term communities of interest isn't defined in the Act, uh, but uh, there is comment about it in the guidelines uh, that are published by the Local Government Commission. And uh, we just wonder whether uh, the meaning to uh, communities of interest in those guidelines is what was intended uh, when the bill was drafted. We understand that particular phrase was used to avoid confusion with simply saying Māori and the rest of the community because the term community also has a certain meaning in the legislation in terms of community boards. Uh, the other observation that we make is that um, in contrast, say, to the Local Government Act, which has a Treaty of Waitangi section, uh, the Local Electoral Act makes provision for Māori representation, but at the front of the Act uh, does not have any sort of overarching purpose uh, for that provision, and we're suggesting that's in the mission and uh, that the Act would benefit from uh, having something along those lines. Uh, looking at the other changes in the Local Electoral Act, uh, minor changes to local board boundaries as part of a representation review. Uh, the council expressed some concern back in 2015 when we were wondering whether we should do a representation review for the 2016 elections. And uh, at that time, uh, when Auckland Council, uh, uh, following Auckland Council being set up, Ward boundaries coincided with local board boundaries and in people's minds uh, were very much the same and we were, f we were a bit concerned that um, if boundaries got out of alignment it would be confusing for people. Uh, so we actually raised this with uh, the Department of Internal Affairs at the time. Uh, they felt it wasn't appropriate to take it up at that stage and so this, this particular proposal is uh, resurrecting that uh, notion, that uh, request that we made to them at the time. Over the, over the years, though, and uh, as a result of the 2019 representation review, I think ourselves and the community now accept that ward boundaries are simply electoral boundaries and that the community uh, must expect that they will change from time to time with population changes. But one of the uh, results of ward boundaries and local board boundaries uh, falling out of alignment is that it creates pockets uh, where the misalignment occurs, where you actually have to publish uh, different permutations of voting documents and so on. And if, if the misalignment was uh, of a minor nature, it would be helpful to have this particular provision in the tool chest, so to speak, so that it could be used if it was appropriate at the time. Uh, the bill suggests that uh, there will be a definition of what we might call minor transfer of population, which will be in regulations. Uh, from the 2019 uh, representation review, uh, the smallest change was around the Royal Oak area, and that was about 1,300 people involved. Uh, and I think that that is what uh, is being expected that sort of minor change is what is expected in terms of what will go into regulations. Uh, it would be my personal view that uh, using this particular provision to change the Waitamata local board boundaries to align with the uh, Waitamata and Gulf board boundaries uh, would be basically out of scope. That's too big a change. But the change that, uh, that occurred at, at, at around Royal Oak is possibly something that 
uh, just simply could be simplified if it was possible to, uh, to align the two boundaries. Uh, <clears throat> further changes in the Local Electoral Act, tithes and recounts. Uh, this addresses a problem that was faced in another council. Uh, a member uh, was elected, declared elected. Uh, there was a, a recount, and, uh, and as a result of the recount, uh, the, elector, the, the, um, the elected member became unelected and was replaced. The problem with, with what happened at the time was that the elected member had already been sworn in. So what the, the process that's being suggested here is that if there's a tie, now the first thing to happen is the, is the judicial recount rather than the other way around. And that's what happened in the situation I mentioned. Uh, the tie was decided by lot and then there was a judicial recount uh, which uh, said that there wasn't actually a tie. So uh, the proposal here is a judicial recount. If the recount ends in a tie, uh, then it's decided by lot. Uh, some changes to provisions for candidate nominations to allow for them to be made electronically, if that's what the electoral officer uh, determines. And that's in line with uh, requests we've made of government in the past uh, that uh, as much as possible of the election process should be electronic. The establishment or reorganisation of local board areas and unitary authority districts. We had noticed for some time prior that if we were to look at the reorganisation of local boards, the amalgamation of the local boards, the abolishment of local boards, the establishment of new ones, they would have to be uh, conducted under the Local Government Act using the process in Schedule 3. While that uh, process in Schedule 3 uh, did refer to uh, local boards throughout, it made sense to actually have a separate process that just dealt with local boards and unitary authorities and not have to, not, not have, to uh, have the wording that related to the things that uh, territorial local authorities had to consider, like transition committees, transfer of assets, what you do with staff and so on. Your Worship, I think that's uh, a summation of uh, the provisions in the bill. I would just say that uh, the feedback from local boards is not all in. Uh, we're having to, uh, we're constrained by the submission process to the select committee, and the recommendation is that we add all the local board submissions uh, to the council submission. Uh, by and large, the local board submissions have been supportive. Um, thank you very much, Warwick, and that was um, as thorough as always. Um, the submissions close on the 14th of September, so uh, we'll probably just um, we'll get our submission as in before that date, but after we've got uh, the feedback from local boards. Um, councillors will recognise that the attachments um, relate, uh, attachment A is the submission itself that we are asked to uh, approve. Uh, B is the local board uh, submissions, C um, is the bill itself, and D compares Schedule 3 and uh, Schedule 3A, as Warwick has just explained. So the, these are things, decisions that we have made before. Um, any tidying up can be done by, I think, under the resolution by uh, the Deputy Mayor and myself, and uh, we'll present submissions if it occurs before the... Um, before the 8th of October. Um, so I'll open it up for questions first. We've got a number of questions. Uh, first question is from Councillor Paul Young. Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question might be not directly uh, to today's topic, but, uh, uh, that's a, but it's a relative. Uh, Christchurch Council, in some world, can be elected two councillors in the same world, like my world, how, how it was in Oakland. And my question is why they only allow the voters have a one vote only, which is only can choosing one councillor candidates in their world in question and other cities. But we are in Oakland, we, have, we can have up to two votes 
can choose the two consular at the same time, such as the Albany War, No Show War, Manicor War. Why we have a difference, and we are both our local government? Can you explain, or mm, yeah. if you have information? I'll, thank I'll you. get Warwick to answer that. I don't think um, the bill touches on that at all, but uh, Warwick, you've, you've probably got an answer off the top of your head that might, might <laughs> help. Uh, this relates to the representation review, which we're required to conduct at least every six years. And the options open to us, actually, in terms of the election of councillors, they can all be elected at large, they can be elected by ward, they can be elected by a combination of at large or by ward, and the council can decide uh, how many councillors in, e in each ward. The constraints in the act is that they got to be spread equally uh, within a plus or minus 10% margin. So it's up, it's up to the representation review. It's not a totally a council decision. It's the council makes a proposal, then there are submissions, there's a final proposal, and then appeals and objections go to the local government commission. I, I know, but the submission question, I, I just asking why the voter there only can have one vote or only one candidate, but we can have one or up to two vote for each or two councillors. The difference. I'm not sure I understand the issue. It's, yeah, as as I understand it, I mean we. In some wards, we have, um, as as in your own council, we have two two councillors, and there was a, there was a um, suggestion I think when we did our last representation review in Monaco uh, that we, you know, maybe we divide the ward up, um, and it went through that sure. process, and and the view was uh, from submissions and from the local boards, I think, not to do so. But you can make that choice uh, to, to make that part of the representation review. And the next review, Warwick is? 2024. 2024, so um, yeah, year after next. So if, if you are of a mind to, to change that, um, a suggestion can be made to make that as part of the uh, representation review uh, in 2024, councillor. Thank you, you think I'll read that. Thank you. Um, second question is Councillor Desley Simpson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Warwick, thank you very much for your work on this. It's significant. Look, my question always comes locally is, you know, why is the Ōrāke ward and the Ōrāke local board areas different? Because I know of population. Um, is there any... What's minor? Is there a definition of minor? You talked about the uh, the Royal Oak example, where potentially there's a tweaking of 1,300. Obviously, there's a lot more in in that um, western side of my ward that doesn't allow a, a line with the local board boundaries. Is there no way we can do more to align local board boundaries and local ward boundaries to keep them more consistent? A significant change to boundaries uh, would need to be dealt with under the new, the proposed new provisions in Schedule 3A, the reorganisation provisions. I, I understand where you're coming from, Councillor, and I recall that you and I met with the uh, New Market and Parnell Business Associations, and uh, they had requested that uh, there be that alignment, but the, there would be too great a population change to simply do that as a as a minor change through a representation review. Okay, I might have a chat to you offline. I'm just looking for the rules to back that up, you know? I mean, it, it's always tricky, isn't it? You know, when your ward and your board boundaries are different mm -hmm. and I understand the population, but I just, population uh, areas, but I just didn't know whether the new bill had numbers in it for minor and and more than minor. Now what the Noting bill, that Royal Oak was through you, your worship, what the bill does have in it is that it, that that number will be in the regulations, not in the bill itself. Okay, got that thanks. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Councillor Pippacoon. Kura mea, um, tenakwe Warwick. Um, thank you for this. I have a great deal of confidence when you bring advice to us and um, with your drafting on the submission, so thank you for postponing your retirement um, <laughs> for our benefit. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Um, my question is really more um, a formal question because I totally support the substance of the submission, but I 
always find it useful with a submission that we have a table that says proposal, response, proposal, response. And I just wondered within the de if the mayor and deputy mayor were minded to um, support that kind of presentation, whether that the feedback that we're giving suits that kind of um, presentation. Because I just mm -hmm. think it's quite hard when you're trying to, you know, in terms of what's public facing to, to pull out the bits that are support, <coughs> support, support. Um, so I would welcome your advice on that. And of course, you know, if it's just not doable or within the time frame or not desirable, totally understand too. But I just thought I'd mention it as it's kind of my feedback when I've been delegated mm. to comment on submissions. Kura. Well, Your Worship, um, it does make some sense in terms of readability, but in, in our particular case, we're basically <laughs> supporting everything. So I'm not sure what the table would look like. Yeah. It's not, yeah. but you're supporting some as with additional advice, so it just means yes, you support the comment is, and then it just means you okay. can, yes. can really see it clearly what is the substance of the submission. But I leave that yes. for the um, for you and yes, the mayor and deputy do mayor to, to mm. consider, just a, just a personal preference of how yes. I like to digest a submission. Kia ora. Yeah, I think basically when I, when I flick through the submission, um, Usually in the first line, it indicates that we, we we support, and then there's a couple of areas there where Eric is, uh, where Warwick is uh, proposing that we should tweak it a little bit. But the the changes aren't hugely substantial; they may be useful, uh, and you know, because this is to a degree about Auckland, um, the select committee might be of a mind to uh, to adopt those tweaks. Um, Councillor Linda Cooper, last Thank question. Thank you. I mean, it's around the area of Māori representation. I mean, you talk about financial implications in 61, 62, 63. Um, I mean, in my mind, two people trying to represent the interests of all Māori across the region seems to me that support that we get as councillors is not going to cut it, like, you know, two, pe two councillors sharing one or two people is not going to support a Māori represent, re representatives because they're going to have huge workload. It's almost going to be like they're going to be at a mayoral level because there's so much. They're right, you know. Um, do we, if, if we, is that, in your comments there, they're kind of quite, you know, generic. Um, is that being thought about? Because I just think throwing one or two people into something as big as that is going to need a huge amount of support. Uh, Your Worship, just a couple of comments on that. Uh, firstly, uh, that there are some issues around that that are being discussed through the current engagement process with Mana Fena and Matawaka. So we've got 19 iwi hapu, uh, and there's an issue there for them as to how would two people represent them. Uh, in terms of the actual number, Auckland Council is, third of, is the largest authority in New Zealand. At the moment, we'd only be entitled to one. Exactly. Um, and poor person. At face value, that, that doesn't look quite right. And when you dig down into the calculations, uh, we've got a, approximately 11 and a half or 12 per cent of the population of Maori. Uh, but the formula that's used basically uses about 6 per cent because it takes into account the number on, on the Maori roll. We, we would have at least uh, well, uh, one or two additional members if it was just based on the population of people of Maori descent. So th there are those issues as well. But the formula that applies to our situation is the same formula that is, applies to the parliamentary arrangements. Thank you. The question, if you'll indulge. It is around remuneration, and this isn't obviously to the remuneration authority, but we've been told that if we have extra councillors, particularly Māori wards, then it'll be the same pool. So I don't know what your view is, but I'm just wondering, you know, that seems like, oh, when you get Māori councillors, well, it'll, you're going to get paid less, which to me seems a little bit of an insult, really. It's saying, oh, when you get there, you're going to get paid less than what they, the, the councillors got paid last term, so too bad. And we all will, and that's, that's the way it is. But I just think that um, I don't know if there's any... You know, I, th I think that we need to, if we're going to attract good people who want to take on a huge role, and especially for the 
one Māori representative. It's, a ma it's like being the mayor for Māori across Tamaki Makaurau. It's a massive job. We require a lot of support if, it, if they're going to be effective. And then they get paid less than we even get paid now. And how do you attract people? And that's the reality of people of good calibre that might be giving up a job, you know, remunerated much more highly than that now. Um, you just don't get people that can afford to do it. So I, I don't know whether you can do anything in this submission, but um, or if we ever get an opportunity to talk to the Remuneration Authority. But I just think that um, yeah, it, it goes counter, and Rose is here, because she's working on it, Rose Leonard, is it goes counter to my understanding that we want to encourage people to do these jobs, not discourage them. Thank you. Well, that was a bit of a yep, comment it, and a question, sorry. Yeah. I, 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 won't I doubt speak in the submission it. we can address that problem, but either Warwick or Rose might want to comment on it. If, if we increase the number of councillors as would be in my mind if I were here, um, to 23, which would give us two Māori councillors. That still works out of the same pool of, of remuneration, which would mean that councillors would have to take a cut in income, um, which does appear to be counterintuitive given the size of the task we have with the population that's served. But, um, Rosa, you, I presume you've come on screen to, to comment on that, so shall I go to you first and then back to Warwick? I have. Thank you, uh, Mayor Phil, and great question. Um, this is something we uh, have been asked to look at and will with the Remuneration Authority. Um, previously, their advice has been to us that the size of the job of governing Auckland doesn't get bigger just because you add more elected members. But that was kind of advice given quite early on in the piece and... I think it's worth challenging a little bit and having a discussion with the REM Authority on because um, conversely, um, having an extra person there doesn't make the job less for you all. So, um, I, and Councillor Cooper points out some other issues that are really important. How do you support somebody who's covering you know, half or the whole of Auckland, what does that look like? And where it's quite right, Māori in our engagement with them have been talking to us just about how difficult that job would be and who would who would be attracted to it. So um, we'll pick it up with the REM Authority um, and consider it, it is a management decision, of course, how we, you know, the number of support officers we give to um, elected members. So that's, um, you know, something for consideration further down the track. So what I'm hearing, real issue, um, but but can't be addressed through these submissions, would have to be taken to the, the, the Remuneration Authority. A uh, new head of that's a guy called Jeff Summers, whom I know. Um, so I, I think there's a good case to take it to them, but not appropriate, Warwick, to in, uh, include that in the submission. No, it's not relevant uh, to the bill, uh, Your okay. Worship. So good point, but needs to be taken up through a, a different channel. But just to, perhaps if I could add to what Rose yep. has said, and just, just to emphasise that this is not an issue to do with Māori representation, it's an issue to do with how the remuneration authority at the moment uh, determines uh, what people are paid. And uh, it might be of interest to members. Uh, there was a Wellington City Council, uh, not so long ago, uh, a member resigned and uh, that left that left a one less member uh, for the pool. So they, they all had to receive an additional amount in their salary. And they objected to that and uh, made a complaint uh, using a lawyer uh, to the Parliament Select Committee that has the oversight of uh, regulatory bodies. And there were submissions by the Remuneration Authority as well, and the Select Committee uh, decided it was that the remuneration authority wasn't stepping outside the bounds of its of, of the uh, of the legislation it was required to work under, but it, it does seem counterintuitive, as you say, Yeah, I, th I think the pooling idea is dumb, frankly. Um, but that's got to be that's got to be dealt with by the new council in a in a different arena. Um, I now have another question, uh, Councillor Al Filipina. Tenaho, Your Worship, Tenaho Rua, Warwick, Tenaho Rose, Ramihi, Tenaho Rua, Ote Mahi. So, look, Your Worship, you ended up uh, commenting on 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 what I wanted to ask the part I was about 
um, and that's in regards to 21, 22, increasing the councillors. But um, Warwick and Rose, look, can you just uh, advise me that the bill is just allows us to increase our numbers from 20, um, and then it's up to the governing body uh, to decide by how many? That's correct, yes. That will happen during the and representation review. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but the bill just allows us to increase the numbers on the governing body, Warwick. Yes, yep. We can take it up to 29, oh, I think, can't yes. we, theoretically, if we want yeah. 29 councils. Yeah, so I've, yep, I've, I've, I've read the, the bill, Your Worship, but, and I know that 23 is the number that allows us, as you, as you pointed out, um, to Māori wards. So, um, so Warwick, the, the, the other part I from me is... Um, um, once we end up deciding, uh, sorry, once the bill goes through, when will be the first opportunity for us um, to end up making that decision? And when I say yes, the incoming council. Uh, the decision about Māori representation is under this bill is a two-step one. Uh, first, uh, by a date on 20th of December, I think it is, in 2023. Uh, there needs to be a decision as to whether or not to have Māori representation. If the council decides to have Māori representation, then it must provide for it in its representation arrangement proposal. Uh, and the, uh, the representation arrangement review is carried out through 2024. Yeah, the, uh, the, the question was, if the bill goes through, which yes. I'm hoping and I have no doubt um, Few other people. Uh, if, if, if goes, sorry. If, if that goes through, yes. um, when will be the first opportunity for the incoming council to decide on the numbers that we wish to increase the council uh, governing body by? Would it, would, would it be in the first year of the new term, or would it? Yeah. And, and that's increasing the number, not about Māori representation. Oh, Your Worship, yes. Um, so the, the legislation uh, requires the first proposal of the Council to be publicly notified, I think it's uh, August in 2024. Uh, so we've got up until then uh, to uh, figure out what our proposal is going to be. We will need to put a paper to the governing body next year uh, proposing a process and if the process is similar to the process we used last time there will be the process will include uh, local boards I think I'm confusing you Warwick um, sorry your worship we Warwick just to try and get to, to what I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. when will the bill mm -hmm. if the history parliament when will it become law Oh, we, we probably don't know that yet, but I imagine I, I imagine that be, because we've only got a narrow window of opportunity to make these changes, that they'll want to try and get it through by the end of this year. But I, 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 I'm saying that just as a presumption, councillor, not as a, something that I've been in, informed. I don't know, Warwick, have you had any indication of when they might want to pass it by? That seems to be in line with uh, the Cabinet papers that the Minister's put you should be yeah. by the end of the year. And yeah, so that that would yeah. that would leave you between February and August of next year for the new uh, governing body to make decisions around that. Um, so that's the time frame we're looking at, so, Warwick. I think uh, February and August 2024. Yeah. Oh, February and August 2024. Okay, that's oh, that's that's yeah, a, that's, that's a longer period of time. Sorry, I'm thinking it's next year. That, that, yeah, yeah, that makes too. it a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I, I, I mean, the indication talking to the Minister for Local Government is that, yes, he wants the bill passed by the end of the year. So that's with our conversations with that is through Te Marawata. But uh, that's why, okay, it's 2024. Look, um, thank you, Your Worship, and I'll just wait for Fakata. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. 
Yes, I was relating uh, to Councillor Filipina's question. Um, do we have a representation review scheduled? Because that seems to be the time when we should be looking at 23 councillors and where do they serve. Yes. We could be carving up wards um, fairly in a fairly large way with three more councillors. So, yeah, when's our timing on that? It, that will happen throughout 2024. And as I've mentioned, the first deadline, uh, I think, is about August 2024, where we have to publicly notify the first proposal. Right, that brings questions to an end. <clears throat> um, now a chance for any, any comments. Um, first comment from Councillor Al Filipina. Kia ora, Worship, and, 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 and thank you again to, to the staff. Uh, Your Worship, uh, it's taken us a while, but we've got back to, to the situation we had uh, previously when um, the recommendation from the working group uh, was, was put to the governing body uh, and also with the Independent Māori Statutory Board. I'm glad we're at this this, this uh, situation now where we'll be uh, uh, putting this submission. You worship the only one part-time for you in regards to F. Um, if you could uh, uh, include myself, depending if I'm around that table. Um, I know it's called nominees, but I'm, I'm making the offer now to, 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 to end up um, appearing in front of the select committee if that happens, obviously prior to the uh, elections being um, um, completed. Uh, Your Worship, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm asking that is because since 2010 and the uh, amalgamation, um, I have been, uh, albeit half a kasi, I've been half all the way through in regards to Māori representation. So just wanted to put that out there in, in regards to uh, if, um, in regard, uh, about the submission. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Alf. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll note that as an expression of interest to be part of the process. Thank you. Um, next uh, comment from Councillor Shane Henderson. Thank you. That came around pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, firstly, I want to say, look, I really support Councillor Filipina as being included in F, if it's OK with um, the Mayor and the meeting. Um, you know, I've seen uh, being involved in the Joint Governance Working Party um, and then being involved in the Māori Wards discussions with uh, Councillor Elf. I've seen some of the passion that he brings to that discussion, so I'm pretty um, happy with that if we can do that. Um, you know, I, I'm really, I really support this. I'm really happy that the government are actually listening to us um, and our advocacy that we've done for many, many years on this. Uh, it's just a really delightful feeling that we're basically, they're acting on exactly what we wanted. Um, but I do want to, I don't want to lose that point from Councillor Cooper around the wages issue. Um, you know, there's a philosophical issue here that when wages get lower, that makes it harder for working class people to stand for election. Eventually, down the line, you have a body of independently wealthy councillors that bring that worldview to the table uh, that is, you know, a loss for the entire city. So I think we need to be always keeping that in mind, and I would encourage staff to really push on that issue. It's not a self-interested issue. It's just this sort of city that I want to see in the future needs to be representative uh, of the people. Um, the other thing is I don't want any votes against Māori wards to be based on side issues that aren't directly related to um, the direct elected representation of our partners in uh, Te Tiriti. And that is a side issue that I think people might pick up and say, oh, look, what about the wages thing? So we've just got to sort that. Um, the other side issue that we have been talking about is the size of our council and how many councils we have. And so this directly addresses one of those points. So if we can address the other one, I'm hoping that we're going to come back and we're going to endorse everything wholesale um, and get Māori wards uh, sorted. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, look, I have no further uh, comments uh, registered with me. Um, just a, a couple from myself. Um, while F talks about the mayor and the deputy mayor, it also talks about all their nominees. And I haven't talked to the deputy mayor about this, but it seems to make sense to me that um, councillors that will be represented around the table uh, in the new council um, should be the ones that make the submission. So. Um, I'm happy if there are further um, uh, indications of interest in that um, for Councillor Filipina to be one of the nominees and uh, any other councillor that has a strong interest in that regard. Uh, secondly, I, I take it um, that everybody is uh, in favour of the submission as drafted. Um, you've had a chance to look at that. So that will be the basis of the submission given. Uh, thirdly, 
while it doesn't spell out what the nature of our future arrangements would be, um, I've picked up a sense that because of the size of our city, um, having 23 councillors, um, in other words, uh, three more than what we currently have, um, would be perfectly reasonable and would allow for the representation of two Māori wards, which makes the task of the Māori ward representative much easier than trying to, for one person to, to represent the whole of the city. And I know the challenges that are faced by Māori members of parliament with huge uh, uh, electorates extending geographically over, you know, I think the member for Southern Māori is uh, Te Tai Tonga, um, <clears throat> covers the whole of the South Island and part of Wellington. So um, while geographically they're not that extended, um, it would be a real challenge for a Māori member um, to, to represent the whole of the city in that way. Um, but that will be a matter for the new council to consider. And um, on the question of remuneration, um, my personal view, I've got no vested interest in this obviously, is the concept of a pool where you reduce the payment if you increase the number of councillors um, bears no relationship to the workload and the ability to attract the people with the capacity, uh, the talent uh, and the energy uh, that we need around the council table. So um, that will be an issue for the new council to, to ad address as well. Um, but my personal view is that um, a councillor that's working full time, meeting his or her constituents' needs as well as participating uh, in the responsibilities of being a member of committee and, and doing the job properly and thoroughly, um, there, there is a case uh, for better remuneration at that, at that level. Um, it should not be, as Councillor Henderson said, something that you go to as a, a retired person that is independently well off um, and doesn't rely on it. I think the more people we can attract around this table that are representative of the cross-section of our society, including those raising young kids and with big mortgages, um, the, the pay rate needs to be attractive enough to enable those people to put the you know 50 or 60 hours a week that they they need to put into the job to do it thoroughly uh, and meet their other financial responsibilities. So that's my my comment as the as an outgoing representative of this table uh, around this table without um, an axe to grind on it. So um, it, it's time to put the uh, the motions uh, the recommendations to the vote. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no, uh, I declare that carried, and I think carried unanimously. Um, <clears throat> we come now to um, item number 13, um, which is um, the decision making in the, in the interregnum period. We've got two periods of time. The, the, last, um, the last governing body uh, meeting is, I think, on the 29th of September. <laughs> Um, and there are no committee meetings after that, to the best of my knowledge. Um, if there are decisions to be made, um, then we need to delegate authority to make those decisions between the 29th of September and I think it's the 14th of October when the, ele the official election results are, are um, called and the term of the existing councillors ceases. Now, it's in my mind that if there is a major decision, um, that would not be made uh, by delegation and would require the calling of an extraordinary governing body meeting, um, and I think that would be the appropriate way to go. Equally, I recognise that effectively um, the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor um, are in the, in the position of being a caretaker in a caretaker role, uh, not taking new initiatives, though tempting though that might be in the last week of office. Um, uh, so um, this would be things that would be done uh, that were of a routine nature that needed to be done within that time frame, or if they were urgent, uh, an extraordinary meeting would be called. From the 14th of October, I think, to the 22nd of October, when the new members are sworn in, 
that delegated authority goes to the chief executive, and I think that's been the, the, the past process. So um, I'm going to ask maybe Councillor Filipina to move Councillor Stewart to second uh, the motions on the screen that basically outline um, what I've just said. Um, but before, uh, so I'll just check with Councillors Filipina and Stewart that they're uh, happy to move and second. Order. Yes, I'm very happy for that. Okay, and uh, thank you for that. And if I can ask uh, Warwick to make any further introductory comments that he uh, deems necessary on this item. Well, thank you, Your Worship. The only thing to add there is uh, perhaps just to point out it's just a bit of a copy and paste as there's a s similar delegations were made prior to the 2013, 2016 and 2019 elections. <coughs> so the precedent is well and truly established. Um, and tempting though it will be for the Deputy Mayor and myself, we will not be doing anything revolutionary over that period of time. Um, right, so uh, I'll just check if there are any questions. I haven't had any registered so far. Yes, uh, I have. Oh, oh well, sorry, not a Cou question. Councillor, comment, Councillor Stewart. Yes. Okay, well, first of all, I just want to thank, thank um, all the committee members that have been on the Civil Defence and all the staff. They've done a wonderful job. It's been a committee that I've really enjoyed, but I can hardly believe that this term of council is nearly over. Um, I'd like to just say that civil defence and emergency, it's, it's, it is a committee that can't rest because, you know, we have earthquakes and we have floods and we have a lot of things that happen that are out of our hands. But one, one thing at the moment, um, I'm working very closely with the Sushi Foundation. It's a non-profitable non-governmental charitable organisation and we've just reached out to the Mayor of Nelson to see whether the sushi can assist. I've had a really long association with the sushi um, going back to 1995. The sushi have been um, very very helpful in, in times of need. Um, so far I've been very um, extremely involved with them when they've assisted with Kaikoura earthquake and the Edgecombe floods. They gave 250,000, I think, to both of those. And um, they've also helped with the Newland floods when we had them and they helped with the typhoon that we had. So I'm working really closely at the moment with them and uh, I won't be resting during the um, election period and, and the time. So so I'm, I'm pleased to see that um, no matter what, whatever happens, that up until the 14th of October, when the election results um, are publicly declared, I, I'll, I'm very happy to be working on behalf of our council um, as the Chair of Civil Defence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I, I will take questions and comments together uh, since that precedent has been established. Um, I will just mention very briefly, and maybe I could have mentioned it earlier at the meeting, um, I have been in touch with uh, Mayor Rachel Rees and Nelson to offer the assistance of our council should it be needed. And in fact, we've had somebody from Auckland Emergency Management, I think, that has been three, three people uh, who have been seconded down to help. And it's, uh, it is appropriate that um, when a, a region like Nelson has suffered in the way that it has, with so many people um, not being able to gain access to their homes and their homes uh, red or yellow stickered, um, that we show that solidarity and we provide that support. So uh, thank you for raising that matter, Councillor Stewart. Um, the next question or comment is from Councillor Henderson. Yeah, thanks. I will make it a comment, actually. It was sort of awkwardly phrased as a question. Um, look, I'm, I'm not sure, um, you know, Mr Mayor, both of you, you and Bill are unfortunately out the door, and I think you make a really good point around um, nominating a chairperson of the Committee of the Whole. Um, you know, we'll miss you both greatly, but I think there is wisdom in bringing someone else into that under B as well. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here, but I'm wondering if Chair Simpson would accept that or whether we're actually nominating uh, people in this committee or whether we're doing that later. Um, we're not specifically nominating in this committee um, and there will need to be a bit of flexibility mm. to, depending on who's available, but be very happy to have the chair of the finance committee as, uh, <laughs> as a, a, a nominee. Um, seems, seems I don't think we, I don't think yeah. we need to, to to write it into the recommendation, but um, as a senior member, she'd be obviously a very appropriate person. Should she be available? 
Of course, I'd be delighted to assist if needed. Thank, thank you, dear. <laughs> that wasn't, I didn't get you. <laughs> right, I have. Uh, oh, actually, I have um, the, the next um, person uh, on the speaking list is Councillor uh, Simpson. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Look, my question was really, I think uh, we all are a team right up until uh, the next team is put together. And my question to you was that should a decision have to be made, what is the process for advising other people um, on our current team about that decision making? Would we send an email around? I just, you know, it would normally, there isn't another meeting. So I was just keen to make sure that there was a good process so that everyone knew what the decisions were made should they need to be made uh, in that period thank you yeah um i i think if, it, if it's a minor decision um we simply notify people that, that that this has been done and i think that um uh goes to the next governing body uh, uh committee in the in the new term which will be in november uh, as i mentioned in my um introductory comments if it's a major decision you know can't imagine what that might be but it's potentially possible that a major decision would have to be made, uh, then there is provision to call an extraordinary meeting of the governing body, uh, albeit in the middle of an election campaign, which you you probably wouldn't welcome, but if it was necessary, um, I'm sure we'd all do it. Does that answer your question, Councillor? It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. That's the uh, end of comments. So uh, I'll, I'll put the resolutions as set out in front of you. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no, uh, I declare that carried. Um, item number 14 is the Local Government New Zealand Conference Report. Uh, it is in the name of um, Councillor Pippa Coombe, so I'm going to ask her to move that we receive the report and Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore to second that. Um, we had um, a number of councillors that attended that. That did not include the Mayor, so there's a, a comment somewhere that the Mayor attended, which um, is not correct, so we shall strike that from the, the record. Um, but uh, if there's any, um, we had um, Al Filipina, who uh, chaired the, um, the, um, the first day uh, of the, uh, the conference for the, the Maori members, and uh, Richard, Councillor Richard Hills and Councillor Angela Dalton, I think, uh, was ill but attended online. So um, any councillor that attended is uh, welcome to comment should they wish to. Um, but if I can ask um, um, Pippa Coombe and Bill Cashwell to move and second that and Councillor Coombe just to speak briefly to the item, briefly. I would be delighted to speak to my homework and I'm not sure I can make it completely brief because there's a little bit of an intro I'd like to do, Mr Mayor, if that's all right with you. Yep, um, the clock is ticking, so please get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also happy to answer questions and reply as well, if that's necessary. Um, so I just, by way of introduction, just want to um, acknowledge that we as Auckland Council have been in Auckland zone for LGNZ for the first time on this term. Um, and we have Auckland zone meetings that are co-chaired by myself and member Northey. And this is really the only opportunity to kind of report back to the governing body on um, the Auckland zone. And just to note that um, all of the, the all elected members are invited to the Auckland zone meetings that are held quarterly and always receive an update from LGNZ president and CEO. And they're very informative and um, very good briefings. And I'm hoping that going into next term, there might be um, more participation in those Auckland zone meetings, because it's a really good way that we can engage with the sector and understand what LGNZ is up to on our behalf. Um, for me, this has also been my full term as being a representative on National Council. I was previously as the local board representative, but didn't have voting rights, and that only changed with a um, change to the constitution that there's also a local board representative. Um, but it's been a real pleasure that I've been able to serve on the National Council for this term of, of, um, of National Council of LGNZ of this, this term. Um, I do think LGNZ has been working really tirelessly on behalf of the sector. President um, Stuart Crosby and CEO 
Susan Freeman Bit Green, who only arrived a couple of years ago and was really thrown into the deep end straight away with the extent of the government reforms that were on the agenda, which I'm sure everybody's very uh, familiar with. Um, LGNZ has also been under the spotlight in terms of are we getting value for money, are they advocating on behalf of the sector, and of course when you're representing I think it's 73 councils that we have across the, the country, it's a, it's a very difficult job to be balancing all of those interests and all of those points of view. But I think we get, um, I'm obviously biased, but I think we do get um, tre tremendous value for money from our membership of LGNZ and having a, a sector representation based in Wellington, um, speaking on behalf of the whole local government sector. I think it's also beneficial to our staff because I know there's a lot of cross fertilization and um, learning opportunities for staff as well with LGNZ and their and the staff sector body um, Tai Tūra, um, the, the um, what did it used to be called, Sol Solgum. They very wisely had a name change to something a little bit more elegant than Solgum. Um, um, and I just also wanted to mention too that in terms of the accessibility of LGNZ, because I think with Auckland Council, you know, we're kind of a large, mean beast and we can do a lot of our advocacy by ourselves. Um, we don't necessarily need to go through LG, LGNZ or rely on their resources. Um, is that one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that the move to a lot of online meetings and just the ability to engage um, on forums, join meetings, um, participate in um, professional development has all moved online and that's been really beneficial and I think especially for local board members have had a lot more awareness and we're all invited to those um, Zooms and learning opportunities and I think we'll see more of that going into next term. So I did just want, that was just a little bit of, I just wanted to be able to use this opportunity Mr Mayor to just make those comments um, in, on with regards to the term that we've just had as an Auckland zone, because I do think that that's kind of significant and we should acknowledge, you know, the fact that we are a member, we do contribute, um, you know, a substantial amount of our membership um, is, we're a third of the country, so, you know, I didn't think it should go without commenting that, um, taking this opportunity to comment on the, the work of the Auckland zone and LGNZ and what they're doing on our behalf. So that brings me now to my, the conference report um, that I'm really pleased to be able to speak on, to on behalf of those who are attending, and I hope that there might be additional comments to make as well. Um, it was a very small deputation that attended the conference um, because of um, budget constraints um, and and Councillor Dalton having to attend online, unfortunately, at the last minute, but at least you're able to be there online, which is another, you know, great technical, technological leap that we've been able to make with the conference. Um, in the report, and I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, if it does say that you were there, I haven't been able to find that reference, but um, wasn't my intention to wrongly attribute um oh it's on the the second page still the mayor deputy mayor and three councillors attended oh oops that was my using a template from last time sorry my mistake not picking that up um so i did find i always find the conference a really fantastic experience in terms of being able to network across the country being able to kind of lift up my eyes a bit to see what's going on um, in different councils and really understanding that we, we share a lot of the same challenges and it's really beneficial to be able to talk to elected representatives from, from very different councils and part of the country but there's a lot of shared experiences and a lot of ability to be able to learn from each other. So there's the networking side and then there's also the presentations that are received um, at the conference was a really um, fantastic range of speakers. Um, although I say in the report that um, three waters kind of dominated the conference, in some ways it was kind of um, not actually the main focus of the conference. Yes, that was a, a kind of a bit of a lightning rod for the protesters that were there every day and wanted to be able to 
um, protest the Minister of Local Government and the Prime Minister. But actually, despite Three Waters, it was actually a lot of much wider debate on a whole range of issues, and particularly on the theme of the conference, Te Wā Heke Mai, the future. Um, and that's what we're all really focused on. I really like the words of the Minister of Local Government, who was talking about that if we, we live the four well-beings, um, that if we have that tikanga framework to guide the conversation, it can be really liberating about how we treat each other and that to be, um, make decisions for the future, we really need to have, a th have to think about that as being good ancestors. And I think that was kind of a theme that really went through a lot of um, the, the conference speakers. Um, particularly because there are a lot of reforms coming and it is a very tumultuous time in local government, a lot of pressures on the sector, um, particularly coming from because of the misinformation campaigns that we've been experiencing. Um, experiencing and when words like co-governance get thrown around as something that is very negative when in fact recognizing our obligations as Tiriti partnership is really based on relationships and there's a whole lot of really fantastic things that are coming from co-governance and I've just experienced that in myself um, being able to be the inaugural co-chair with Nicola McDonald on the Hauraki Golf Forum, that co-governance leadership has really transformed the, the Hauraki Golf Forum. And I just, just wanted to, in kind of wrapping up about the conference, I just wanted to acknowledge too um, that the sector is really changing. When I first went to conference in, I think my first one was in 2012, it really had the, the vibe of an old boys club and an old, old girls club and, and some parts, um, you know, it was kind of all the provincial mayors getting together for a good time. I've got a bit of a soundtrack of the deputy mayor here, but he's removing his device. It's, <laughs> the audio's come on. Um, and, you know, it was very noticeable that LGNZ, local government, just didn't know what to do with local boards either and the new um, governance framework of Tamaki Makoto. And it's just been fantastic to see the change in the sector and also the way in which LGNZ and the conference really embrace the differences that we now have in representation and that we're far more reflecting the communities that we wish, wish to represent. And no more is that seen in terms of Māori representation and participation. And I was really fortunate to be able to, t to attend to Maruata, the hui, the day before the conference. And um, I understand it wasn't even that long ago that it might be sort of a half a dozen people or a dozen people in a room getting together um, Māori representatives, and now that's, that's a hui of over 150 people. And it's just a fantastic, the conversation there, um, and the debate and the reflections on Māori participation and the, the benefits that it's bringing all communities. And one thing we're going to really see, and this ties into the, the um, item that we had on the Local Government Electoral Legislation Bill, is that 35 councils will have Māori wards um, next, next triennium. And that's going to bring in 50 new Māori representatives across the motu. And that is just amazing. And so it's not, so that I think is really going to change the dynamic of local government. Um, also another change has been the young elected member um, participation. And they laid a bit of a wedu down uh, down to us at the conference and their fantastic presentation. And I'm sure Councillor Hills would like to talk about the Yem Hui that was held as part of the conference as well. So really great participation across the conference. And just finally, I also want to acknowledge um, the Minister for Local Government who, prior to her um, taking up that role, I think there were about five ministers in nine years in local government who just traveled through. They didn't really want it as a portfolio. Whereas uh, Minister Nanaya is just amazing about her, her commitment to the sector, to local government, and she actually wanted the role um, when she was um, re-elected in 2020. So we're really fortunate to have a minister who is so focused and dedicated and willing to be at the conference for the whole three days. And I think she takes a lot of strength as well, well away from um, being around local government and sharing our co-papa. So um, 
it's all there in the report as well. It was, it's a very kind of brief um, report because we all take different things from it, from those who attend. Um, but looking ahead, I hope that there can be greater participation and funding made available because it is a great learning experience. And I just want to say, I will end, um, that I've got a new appreciation for Palmy now that I was able to spend um, four days there. I'd never spent um, four days in Palmy before. And um, just a lot of fantastic things there. And I was able to take part on the cultural walking tour and um, just learnt a, a huge amount, particularly around the, with the host iwi, um, Rangatani. Um, who were also there for the whole conference, which is a new new um, um, experience for for the conference. So really pleased that I was able to attend. I'm really delighted that I've been able to be on National Council for the last three years and thank um, my colleagues for that opportunity um, and really do commend um, this report to everybody. Namahi nui ki Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for your humouring me with a bit more of a um, longer introduction than you were anticipating. Yep, 13 minutes, Councillor. <laughs> um, look, um, thank you, thank you for that, and if I can thank um, uh, Pippa and those delegates that attended, but also uh, the councillors that have been part of the, the last three years and made contributions in different aspects of uh, local government New Zealand and including the Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Richard Hills. Um, uh, I, from a local board level, I have to mention Councillor uh, Member Richard uh, Northey as well. Um, I have no questions, um, but if, is there any comment that anybody else wants to make um, regarding the conference? It's uh, a fairly uh, full report, and I, I just want to comment on um, our local board member from Franklin, Logan Sewell, who some of you will know. Logan's just a, a tremendous young guy. Um, first term on council, I think he got elected at 19. Um, and he was um, won the Young Elected Member of the Year Award for the absolutely tremendous effort that he made during uh, the COVID period and uh, the vaccination process. So great to see um, you know, young people like Logan coming forward because uh, they represent the future of the council. Right, I have no indications of comments. Going to do Elf's three second rule and uh, we'll therefore uh, put the recommendation that we receive the report with thanks. Um, <laughs> all those in favour, please aye. say aye. 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 To the aye. contrary, no, uh, I declare that carried. Um, item number 15, I think we're at. The Summary of Governing Body Information Memoranda Workshops and Briefings, an Information Only Report. Um, Councillor Young, can I ask you to move that? And Councillor Dalton, maybe to second it. Um, if there's no comments or questions, I'll put the motion uh, that we note uh, progress on the forward work, uh, sorry, on the receive, the, yeah, note the progress on the forward work program. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Uh, item number 16 is referral from the Appointments and Performance Review Committee uh, regarding the update on the Chief Executive's performance objectives for the last financial year. This is an open process report, so I'll move and ask Councillor Fletcher to second this, and the wider discussion happy, will be held. Happy to second. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Wider discussion will obviously be held uh, in confidential. Uh, if there are no questions and comments, uh, I'll... Uh, put the motion that um, that we um, receive the report, I think, is the the, the notion. I'm, I'm going so fast, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Uh, carried. Uh, item number 17 is consideration of extraordinary items. There are none. So I'll move now to the procedural motion to exclude the public. Uh, on two items, one relating to the FIFA Women's World Cup and the other relating to the Chief Executive's performance. Uh, these are being discussed under confidential because uh, in relation to the former that if made public it may affect adversely the Council's position in uh, current negotiations and the latter because it will contain information that will uh, need to be confidential until released to the New Zealand Stock Exchange on the 30th of September. 
So I'll move, I'll ask Deputy Mayor to second that we move into to, uh, confidential. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. Uh, members, you need to sign out and come back under the confidential link. So I'll just take a, a, a five-minute break. At